Agriculture has been at the heart of Indiana's economy for centuries. Farmers have taken full advantage of the state's rich, fertile soil, from harvesting crops to raising livestock. But now, there's a new type of farming that's gaining popularity in Indiana, and instead of using land, it utilizes water. Aquaculture, or fish farming, is the practice of raising and harvesting fish or other aquatic life in a controlled environment. There are four culture systems in which you can raise fish. Ponds, raceways, recycling systems, and cages. This video focuses on the cage cultural system and the necessary steps you need to take in order to start and maintain a successful aquaculture operation. Before investing any capital into a new business venture, it's always best to examine the economics of the industry. Doing thorough market research and developing a marketing and business plan will help put you on a path of profitability. You need to identify the type of markets that are available to you, who the major players are, and the strength of the competition. There are several factors that determine which market will be best for your product, from the size of your operation, to the method of distribution, live, frozen, or processed, to the transportation of the fish. The markets are scalable from home consumption to retail sales to wholesale. For smaller cage operations, selling direct to the consumer will usually be the most profitable. I worked at a power plant and I just started telling people I had fresh fish and uh, word of mouth, I could sell everything I processed every year. Farmers markets are a great place to sell local fresh fish to the community. Another potential market is in selling directly to local restaurants, grocery stores and caterers. Live fish retailers, such as Asian grocery stores, is another market that has a steady demand for live fish. In order to be successful with this market, it's necessary that you cultivate good relationships with the various retailers and area restaurant owners. Depending on the size of your cage operation, selling to wholesalers and processing plants is a possibility. While the profit will be less than selling directly to the consumer, the time and effort required in selling the fish is much lower. Although the initial capital investment is fairly low compared to other agribusinesses, you still need to educate yourself on the potential markets if you want to have a financially successful cage culture operation. Indiana Market Maker is a comprehensive online resource that provides a link between producers of agricultural products and consumers. Talking to a practicing aquaculture farmer in your area would be a worthwhile educational experience. The Purdue Aquaculture Economics and Resources website is also a valuable resource that you should take full advantage of. After determining that aquaculture farming is something that you want to pursue, the first step is to locate a body of water that will best suit your needs. Make certain that your site will be able to support the ecological and biological demands that a cage operation places on it. Ponds, lakes, and quarries are all potential sites for cage farming. There are several important criteria to consider when selecting a site. The size of the body of water, the surface should be at least one half acre, but preferably an acre or larger. The water depth should be at least six feet. Adequate depth is crucial to maintain water circulation, so oxygen can enter the densely populated cages and waste can be removed. Water quality plays a significant role in choosing a site. You need to determine the watershed of the area. 
A body of water located near land heavily populated with livestock or crops could be problematic because of the possibility of animal waste and fertilizers draining into it. Trees surrounding the site could also be an issue because you need good wind exposure to maximize the availability of dissolved oxygen reaching the fish. In order for fish to survive and thrive in a caged environment, sufficient dissolved oxygen levels need to be maintained. Therefore, selecting a site that has access to electricity will allow you to use aeration equipment that will sustain levels on a consistent basis. The site you select must be accessible 365 days of the year. Make sure the roads can be accessed in any type of weather for feeding, observation, maintenance, and harvest of fish and cages. Access to cages can be either by boat or pier. This should be planned in advance, both for financial and management considerations. Whether the site you select is a pond on your own property or a lake you rent from a landowner, you want to protect your investment by securing your site from poachers. You've researched the markets and found a suitable body of water to start your cage operation. The next step is to decide what species of fish to raise. This can seem like a daunting task considering the number of species to choose from, but two things should guide you in your selection. Marketability of your product and the type of aquaculture operation. In the cage culture environment, certain species do much better than others. In Indiana, tilapia is a popular fish for cage farming because of its large size, rapid growth, and hardiness. If you're going to start raising fish in cages, I really recommend using tilapia first. You know, tilapia are so easy and they grow so quick. Other species that do well in cages are hybrid striped bass, rainbow trout, and catfish. Also, largemouth bass has shown promise in the cage environment. You need to factor the length and time of the year for the growing season of each species because they vary. For instance, tilapia and rainbow trout each have a six-month growing season until they're ready for the market, while the largemouth bass and hybrid striped bass take 18 months to raise. Since tilapia is a tropical fish, it doesn't do well in the cold, so they need to be harvested before the water temperature drops below 60 degrees. Obviously, they won't survive an Indiana winter. Conversely, rainbow trout are cold water fish and cannot handle temperatures above 65 degrees and so will not grow through an Indiana summer. Each species of fish is going to have their own set of guidelines for growing and harvesting. For additional guidance, you can go to the website indianafishfarming.com and or contact Purdue Extension. Once you've settled on a species or species, you need to select a fish hatchery to purchase the fingerlings that you will use to stock your cages. A hatchery is a facility where fish eggs are hatched in a controlled environment. The small fish hatched from those eggs are referred to as fingerlings. Just like determining which species is right for your operation, you'll need to do research on the hatcheries and find one that has a reputation of dependability, quality, fair prices, and delivery rates. Depending on the species, the price per fingerling ranges approximately from 25 cents to $1.50. cents. The price per fingerling will decrease as the volume of purchase increases. For a list of commercial suppliers, go to the Indiana Department of Natural Resources website. When selecting fingerlings, you want to make sure that they are all of similar size because you want uniform growth in the individual cages. In order to determine size equality, graders are used to separate the fingerlings into common sizes. You want to avoid runts and select fingerlings that are as large as possible. And be sure that cannibalistic species like bass have been feed trained.
One of the main factors that will determine the number of fingerlings purchased will be the cage size. You want five to seven fingerlings per cage cubic foot. For example, if your cage is four foot wide, four feet in length and has a depth of four, you have 64 cubic feet of space in your cage. Therefore, you could stock your cage with 320 to 448 fingerlings. For a beginning fish farmer, it is recommended that you start at the lower end of the stocking density range. Cages come in all sizes depending on the size of the fish, but the minimum depth of all cages should be 4 feet. Despite the variety of cage shapes, the material used in the construction is fairly consistent. You can purchase cages through a supplier, fellow fish farmer, or build them yourself. They're inexpensive to build, $150 to $500 per cage, and some of the material can be found at your local hardware store like PVC pipe for the frame and a flotation device to keep the cage buoyant. The plastic mesh or PVC coated wire mesh to go around the frame will have to be purchased from a specialty supplier. Check the web for online cage building directions or contact Purdue Extension. The mesh size you use for the cage will be determined by the fingerling size and species. The size of the mesh should be no smaller than one half inch to maintain maximum water circulation through the cage. To get the exact mesh size suited for a particular species of fish, you'll need to contact a supplier. A cage lid is important because it prevents the fish from escaping and keeps predators out. Another significant component to the cage is the feed ring. A feed ring keeps floating feed inside the cage and can be attached to the cage or suspended from the lid. The placement of the cages in the water is another factor to take under careful consideration. If you have a multiple cage operation, be sure there is at least 10 feet in between each cage to ensure adequate water circulation. The water depth should be at least six feet with a minimum of two feet of water beneath the cage to ensure that waste is kept away from the fish. You also want to make sure that your cages are away from frequent disturbances like other animals or people. You don't want swimming or fishing near your cages. And finally, the cages must be easily accessible in all weather conditions, either by pier or by boat. Water quality management is critical to a successful aquaculture operation. In the densely populated cage cultural environment, supplying enough dissolved oxygen to the fish can be difficult if a farmer relied solely on nature. Some of the natural factors that affect dissolved oxygen levels are water temperature, wind, the salinity of the water, and plant photosynthesis. There is a mechanical process that allows you to manipulate the dissolved oxygen concentration levels called aeration. Similar to pumps used in aquariums, an aerator pumps air through the cages, oxidizing the water in the process. While the aeration will increase the startup cost of production, it is well worth the investment to reduce risk. In cage operations, low dissolved oxygen levels in ponds and lakes is the number one cause of most fish kills poor growth and disease outbreak. And you, you do need to aerate. You know, a lot of people don't think you need aeration if you got bigger bodies of water, but you, you need water moving through your cages. And sometimes on hot summer days, you know, you don't get a whole lot of wind to get movement. So I really think persons need aerators, especially if you're in the cage culture business. The dissolved oxygen level of the water needs to be carefully monitored, as does the water temperature. Fish growth, reproduction, and sometimes survival are all tied to water temperature. Every species of fish will have an optimal water temperature range for growth. Dropping below that recommended temperature range jeopardizes the survival of the fish. Another issue you need to be aware of is pond turnover. This commonly occurs in the summer 
when cool, oxygen-depleted water at the bottom of the pond is forced by severe weather conditions to the top, replacing the warm, oxygen-rich layer. To prevent this natural occurrence, you pump air to the pond bottom and proactively mix the two layers of water. This is called destratification. Water test kits are a must for any fish farmer looking to have a successful operation. Along with measuring dissolved oxygen levels and water temperature, knowing the alkalinity of the water and ammonia levels is crucial. Each body of water is going to have its own chemical makeup. Your job as a fish farmer is to provide an optimal environment for your fish. In order to do that, you need to ensure and maintain the water quality. Fish are shy animals that are easily susceptible to stress. Cage farming is inherently stressful on the fish because of the direct handling in the capturing, hauling, stocking, and harvesting of fish. Overly taxed fish will lead to poor feeding, which leads to stunted growth, so you must take special care and minimize stress whenever handling fish. When purchasing fingerlings, be sure your supply has been properly graded and is disease free. Always try to buy your fingerlings from a reputable supplier who will guarantee his product. Transporting fingerlings and market ready fish should be done in a well oxygenated container. Whether you're using a commercial sized hauler or a container that fits in the back of a pickup, you need to make sure the water is properly aerated. The water temperature in the hauling container should match the water temperature the fingerling or fish currently inhabit. A fluctuation in water temperature can lead to immediate death or diseased fish. Temper the water in the container by adding the fish's source water, either from a tank if it's a fingerling or from the pond or lake if you're harvesting. For instance, for every 10 degree change in Fahrenheit, you'll need to wait approximately 20 minutes. Adding salt to the hauling container helps reduce stress and can remove certain parasites that could infect the fish. Be sure not to overfill the containers with fish as it will increase the stress on the fish during transport. Also keep in mind the longer the travel time, the more stress the fish will experience. Stocking and harvesting the cages is among the most stressful situations the fish will encounter. A well thought out plan on how you'll transport the fingerling from the hauler to the cage or move market-ready fish from the cage to the hauler is of utmost importance. Minimizing the number of steps and duration of the process will reduce handling stress. After stocking cages with fingerlings, don't be surprised if the feeding response is less than expected. The fish need to recover from the haul and adjust to the cage environment. Be judicious with the feed for the first couple of days. You do not want to overfeed. Selecting the proper feed and following proper feeding practices is crucial for a successful cage farming operation. It's unlikely that fish will receive any natural food in the caged environment, so it's the farmer's responsibility to feed the fish on a regular basis. There are several types of feed on the market, and the species of fish will determine the one you select. Store the feed in a dry and cool place, and always be sure the feed is fresh and not moldy. Whichever brand of feed you purchase, it must provide a complete diet. The feed also must be of the floating variety. Sinking feed will fall through the cage and not be eaten, while the floating feed will remain trapped within the feed ring and allow the farmer to observe the fish. Watching feeding behavior is the best indicator of the fish's overall health. You just have to keep an eye on them and see if they're acting right and, and eating. You know, any kind of livestock, if they're not eating, there's something wrong. Feeding method will be determined by cage location. Hand feeding is preferred to allow for the opportunity to observe feeding behavior. 
If a cage is located near a pier, then an auto or demand feeder can be used to feed the fish at regular intervals. Be sure to properly maintain the feeder and that it's functioning correctly. And even though the feeding process is automated, you still want to observe feeding behavior daily. The fish should be fed daily at least six days a week. Feeding behavior will be more aggressive when water temperature is at optimal level and oxygen levels are high. Between mid-morning and late afternoon is usually the best time to feed. Newly stocked fish will sometimes take a little longer to feed as they adjust to the new environment. Research feeding habits on the species you're growing and get a better understanding of what to expect. Feeding the correct amount to the fish is vital to fish health and your bottom line. 40 to 50% of your production cost is feed. Overfeeding the fish will not only deteriorate water quality and lead to stress and possibly diseased fish, but it will also increase the amount of feed that you'll need to purchase. Underfeeding will result in poor growth and a disappointing harvest. You'll want to feed the fish until they're satiated. Feed them all they want to eat within a 10 to 30 minute time span. For a new fish farmer with little experience, the best method to determine proper feed amounts is by calculating weekly weights of the fish and adjusting feed amounts accordingly. By dividing the total weight by the number of fingerlings at stocking, you can determine individual weight. By checking with a table that pertains to your species, you can figure the proper feed amount for an individual fish. From there, you multiply the amount of total fish weight to obtain a feed quantity estimate. Every week, you pull a sample from the cage, weigh them, divide to find the individual weight, check the table, and multiply for proper feed amount for the entire cage. Always keep accurate records of the amount of feed being used. Proper feed amounts play a vital role in the health of your fish, as does constant observation of the feeding response. Observation is crucial in anticipating and avoiding problems. A change of behavior during feeding is an indicator that you may have a health issue that needs immediate attention. Vigilant observation and proper handling techniques to reduce stress are important things a farmer can do to keep the risk of disease at a minimum. There are other practices you'll need to perform to maintain the health of fish. Keeping the cages clean of biofouling organisms is important to fish wellness. Biofouling is the growth of algae and or bryozones on the sides and bottom of the cages. It's a common problem that can restrict water flow in the cages and reduce dissolved oxygen levels. You'll need to periodically check the cages and if detected, remove the biofouling with a stiff brush or broom. Do not lift the cage out of the water and to avoid causing any stress to the fish, remove the biofouling using slow movements. Not only do you want to keep the cages free from harmful bacteria, but you want to make sure you keep the equipment clean as well. After using a dip net in an individual cage, you'll want to wash and disinfect it properly before you use it again. Despite all best efforts, at some point you will encounter diseased fish. Poor or irregular feeding habits will be the first clue. The outward manifestation of disease include skin discoloration, open wounds or lesions, thin erosions, spots, and general erratic behavior. Fish will begin to die off, and you'll need to act quickly and get a diagnosis from an accredited diagnostic lab. A fish specimen and water sample will need to be sent to a lab. State conservation fisheries, extension aquaculture programs, and possibly local universities can provide this service. In Indiana, Purdue University's Animal Disease Diagnostic Lab is the place to send your specimens. Once the diagnosis has been made, the lab will recommend the best course of treatment. This may require a consultation with a veterinarian. You may have to switch your feed supply from normal to 
a medicated feed to combat an infection. Chemically treating the entire pond or in and around the cage area is another option. During any treatment, always be sure to monitor dissolved oxygen levels and supplement with aeration when needed. You've made it through the growing season, and now your fish have reached minimum market size. It's important to know that the value of the fish per pound does not increase once minimum market size has been reached. It also works in your favor to harvest the fish as soon as they reach market size to avoid needless risk. Every species growing season will differ in length, and other factors affect it as well, such as weather, size and density of fingerling stock, and time of year. You should stop feeding the fish two days before harvesting in warm weather and up to a week in cooler weather. You do this so food can move through the fish's digestive system before hauling and processing. Excessive waste in the hauling tank can lead to disease and possibly death. Depending on your setup, the process may vary, but it's important to be as efficient as possible in transporting the fish from the cages to the hauler. Keeping stress to a minimum is key to maintain fish health. You'll need to fill your hauler with water from the pond. Add salt to the tanks and turn on the aeration. Now that the hauler is ready, bring the cage to shallower water. This crowds the fish into a restricted area and allows for easier access. Scoop the fish with a clean dip net into a bucket and transport the fish to the hauler. Repeat the process, filling each tank with an equal number of fish. Now the fish are ready to take to the market or processing facility. Cage culture is a popular form of aquaculture that has many advantages that include resource flexibility, low cost, and simplified harvesting. However, it is not without its risks. You know, cages is an easy way to start, but still, it's farming. There's a lot of things that can happen. Educating yourself to the proper practices is vital to successful operation. While this video provided a comprehensive introduction into cage culture, it's recommended that you continue your education by seeking out existing literature and advice from Purdue Extension.